capital raising, I think, is kind of overcomplicated in a lot of ways. I think there's there's different ways to go about it. Um, you know, Neil Bawa has a great model where he has, you know, amazing marketing and funnels and stuff, and he's able to grab like fifty thousand dollar check from people he's never met. You know, just total mm-hmm. strangers. He has a really robust system. Um, but then the, the the route I kind of like to go that I see a lot of people do is like friends and family, because essentially you've probably heard like the no like trust triangle like if someone's going to invest with you or do business with you they need to know like and trust you and at friends and family you can just skip a lot of steps with that and friends and family can write bigger checks so you know if i can get um 20 dollars checks from strangers that's going to take a lot of effort a lot of framework um but it is automated um mm-hmm. so it's something that kind of runs while you're sleeping um but at the same time you know you can easily find two very wealthy friends in your network to write you $500,000 checks, or you know, five people write you $200,000 checks. Welcome, everybody, to another great show. This time with Bang Heggy from uh, Austin, Texas. This guy is pretty young. I mean, you can see it on their faces for our, our viewers in YouTube, man. He's only 21 years old and he's a multifamily investor, again, from Austin, Texas. Uh, he went to college and he's, uh, he was doing uh, engineering, um, but he f- soon realized that that wasn't what he wanted to do. Uh, so he started pursuing different bench- uh, avenues towards entrepreneurship and financial freedom. Uh, and then later he stumbled into things like wholesaling, Shopify, drop shipping, selling t-shirts, and even worse, he said on his bio, Thinking that he's smarter than a computer, he's starting into uh, option trading. Um, so now he's uh, he's a multifamily investor. He's closed in over uh, 330 units uh, with uh, assets totaling in the uh, 20 million dollars. Uh, again, he's uh, he's 21 years old. He's uh, capital raising. He has, has a lot of experience in capital raising for uh, larger multifamily deals. And without any further ado. Uh, Van, please, uh, you know, I mean, share your story with the audience. Tell us how you started. Um, and I'm very curious to know what got you into this mindset of entrepreneurship and, and success uh, at such a young age. I mean, a lot of people at your age, all they're thinking is about partying and drinking. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, German. Um, and thank I'll, I'll kind of go back and to, like, explain that story. So, like you said, um, I came into college, or I guess I should even backtrack. Like I just sucked at school my whole life. I just could not fit the script. And I was, you know, diagnosed with like ADHD when I was really young. And uh, I always thought of it as like a deficiency, you know, like I, I kind of didn't realize like what my frame was. Cause I always like score really high on tests and stuff, but like, I just could not do my homework. <laughs> like yeah. anytime I had to take on any responsibility of any kind, I just blow it. Um, and, but somehow, you know, because I, scored good on a test. I got into UT engineering. Um, and then finally sophomore year, I was able to do that internship. I was like, ah, finally, I don't have to do homework. I could just go work and make money. And then like two days in, I just hated it. And then I had to get out of there. And, uh, but obviously I, I was stuck there for the nine months that I had to work there. So I started looking at just everything I possibly could, how to make money, you know? And of course I fell into a bunch of little rabbit holes of like, Oh, drop shipping. And you know, this 22 year old drives eight Lambos and has a private jet. And yeah, of course he doesn't, but just like stuff like that. And, um, of course I turned to the stock market first. Like I said, I was losing to the computer. <laughs> so me trying to day trade with very limited knowledge, just getting pounded by, you know, quantitative hedge funds and stuff. Um, but I was having fun and I was learning and I really was kind of starting to understand the concept of investing. And One of the biggest books I first read was uh, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. And he focuses mainly mainly on value investing in that. But it kind of made me realize, like, it kind of shifted my mindset to more of like a long-term wealth building mindset. And then eventually I kind of stumbled into real estate. And then I just fell in love because I was like, oh, wow, this is something that I can actually wrap my head around. That makes sense. It's long-term. I can see it. I can touch it. Um, And it just, it, it made a lot more sense. And it was a lot less speculative. And then... I kind of fell in love and I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to build my wealth with. And like I said, I think the partying and stuff, um, you know, not to say that I'm, you know, some incredible saint, but like, I think when I really was feeling that pain of like not wanting to do that same job for the next 60 years, 
I really was like, man, I just was, you know, more so than being pulled towards an amazing life. I was just being pushed away from something I was super scared of. And so I think that was really the drive that kind of just gave me tunnel vision. And then, yeah, I, I decided I wanted to get like a duplex. I was kind of like um, enamored with the house hack, like bird strategy, which I think is a great strategy. I think that's great for anyone who wants to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going to take the money from that internship to buy the house. And then I actually ended up pretty close, um, like right after my internship, had all my money saved up uh, and I was getting ready to close on one. And I had a meeting with my buddy, who's not my business partner. And he was also a very young dude named Kyle Marcotte. And he had just closed on a syndication. And he said, man, why are you trying to get like one or two units? I just got 107. And I was like, what? What is that? How does that even work? Like, who are you working with? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. And um, it was a whole nother world I'd never even heard about. It was like the idea that you can leverage other things because that's one concept that I kind of missed when I was getting into real estate investing is like leverage. Like, obviously I was going to put money down on an FHA loan and I was going to get a loan and buy a house with it. And I remember thinking how cool I was like, oh, look at me. I'm going to get a house and I'm young. Um, and then I realized, wait, you can just think bigger and you can scale that bigger. And then anyway, that's how I found myself in syndication. And um, eventually kind of found myself into being a capital raiser. So I just was, you know, talking to people, essentially bringing investors money to big deals. And in exchange, you get a seat at the table. Um, you can put your name on the operating agreement and you can. Uh, get a little piece of the pie. So that's how I got into my first deal. Nice, man. I, that, that's an awesome story. Uh, let me ask you this. So your friend got you in syndication. And for for our our viewers, people that are not probably not familiar with this, even though we bring it up a lot, uh, what does that syndication for you look like for the first time? And how do you vet the, uh, uh, the, 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 the people that were raising money for that syndication? Yeah, so not to be too technical, but a syndication, you can syndicate anything. You can syndicate a computer, a Snickers bar, as Bruce Peterson says, you, you can do anything. Essentially, all it means is your crowdfunding. So like, mm -hmm. um, you know, for this example of like apartments, um, if an apartment costs $10 million, you can you can get a commercial loan for, let's say, um, 70%. So that means you need to put $3 million down. Well, instead of paying $3 million out of your pocket, you can raise $3 million from other people. And essentially, you can give them most of the pie for providing that down payment, but then you get a little slice of the pie just for putting in the sweat equities. So that's nice. specifically what I'm referring to as indication. Um, because again, with these investors, their reward for you know putting up the down payment is that they get to participate in like returns of the property. So like a, a multifamily property or most real estate in general should <laughs> at least return a lot of money. Um, so if I'm an investor, I can, and, and let's say those syndications might have 20 investors who all total up to, let's say you're raising 2 million and you have 20 investors. They're each given a hundred grand, right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so if I'm an investor and I invest a hundred grand, I might expect 10% a year on my money. So, um, Essentially, and there's a ton of benefits that, you know, we can get into if we want of why you would want to invest in these syndications. Um, but that's essentially like their incentive is that they help you buy the property and in return, they get a lot of money back. You know, it's a great investment. So Great. So for you, for example, you mentioned that you had the down payment for a house, right? Um, and your friend kind of opened up this new world of multifamily investing. And what you could buy, you know, you could buy this house and put a down payment on this house and it was, it, it was going to be yours. Now you're investing in so many units, right? Um, how does that look, that, that, that shift of mind, you know, for a, for a young 20, for a 21 year old, um, the risk, you know, versus the, uh, the benefits of, well, I'm buying a house. This is what everybody's doing. I've never heard of this now that I can put this little much of money into this with a bunch of people that I don't even know. I mean, at that point, you probably didn't know. You just knew about yeah. the idea. Uh, how do you, how do you, um, I mean, for, for, for lack of terms, how do you overcome that? Probably that fear that it's like, hey, man, this sounds too, too good to be true. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Cause I definitely did skim over the fact that like, 
it, it wasn't just a switch that flipped and I went, oh, I'm going to do this now. You know, it took a lot of mm-hmm. studying, a lot of headache, a lot of like, man, what what is this? Um, and like I said, I, I was a little skeptical at first, but the more I read, the more I realized, oh my gosh, people are doing this. And so the the coolest part of the mindset shift is obviously when Kyle was trying to convince me that syndication was the real deal. He was telling me like, man, look, you know, being part of a big deal, um, you know, it's better for your track record. You can make more money. You can scale your career faster. And it's the same amount, if not less work than owning a one unit by yourself. And I was like, man, there's no way. Like, how could that possibly be the case? And when you look at like, obviously syndication, you're leveraging other people's money. You're also leveraging other people. So like you can, a lot of them have third party management, take care of a lot of stuff for you. Um, you know, if, if you own a single family house and your toilet breaks, that's your problem. And uh, the, just a lot of little things like that, that economy of skills really play a factor too. So that was something, and it almost felt like less risk the more I looked into it because it's like, you can put a lot of those things on other people. So like if, if I were to buy that duplex by myself, I wouldn't really know what I'm doing, right? Like I've never owned real estate. I wouldn't really understand like the ins and outs of foundation and structure and even how to renovate a property. Like that would all be stuff. And it'd be a great learning experience, but it almost seemed like less risk. I'm like, man, I can just, you know, ride the coattails of these guys who have been doing this for a really long time and know what they're doing. And I can learn that way without actually having like um, too much stake in the operations of the deal. Cause like when, when you have a bigger team, you can just lean on more people. So I think that's kind of the, like the transition I took of being like, I'm going to do this all myself and I'm going to be responsible for everything to kind of like learning how the system's going. Um, And then I can get into like how that kind of set me up to now like do it on my own and actually know what I'm doing. Yeah. Let's, let's transition into that. So you got into the syndication, right? Usually the people that get into syndications is people that want to invest their money, what we call passive investors. Right. And it's like, well, all I want is, is my check every month or every quarter. And then I want my equity when you sell or refinance the, the, the property in five to seven years. Um, in your case, did you were you able to have some kind of uh, insight on how the business is run? Did you have somebody inside the syndication that was that was kind of mentoring you on on how you could eventually do it on your own? Yeah, absolutely. So the way I even got into that first deal, um, I was just reaching out to tons of people. Just trying to learn as much as I possibly could, you know, not even looking for anything more than just like, tell me about what you do and like what your job is and what you're trying to do. And I ended up meeting my partner, Andy McMullen, and he kind of brought me on under his wing. And he had, you know, he's had like 20 years of experience in real estate and he was kind of showing me the ropes. And we ended up partnering with Matt Faircloth, who's a really big operator. And um, we were able to raise money for his deal. It's now closed in North Carolina. And he kind of like, you know, obviously being part of the general partnership, um, being in some of the meetings and like seeing what's going on, how the deals run, how deals are run in general, just um, that is like some of the biggest learning experiences. Cause again, it's like, it's cool to know what kind of paint and cabinets and floor to use, which is super important. I'm not taking anything away from that, but it's also kind of crazy to watch, you know, seven figure checks and stuff and, you know, 10 figure checks even. And like, I'm sorry, nine figure and uh, no eight figure. Jeez. Where's my brain doing? But to, to see that kind of operational excellence and like, I feel like there's just, you know, there's even economy of skill and learning. Yeah. And I feel like seeing all those business processes and stuff um, really kind of shaped like what I want to do going forward. Uh, and like I said, you know, being essentially a capital raiser, I am part of the general partnership and I am involved in like day to day operations because you have to be. Um, but I it's really kind of opened my eyes to like, I feel like I've kind of. You know, I'm, I'm at sea level now. I feel like I was drowning and then now I'm up at sea level. So mm-hmm. now I feel like I see, you know, how the sausage is made. I feel like I know kind of what to do and I feel a lot more comfortable doing it on my own, um, which is actually the direction I'm headed now. So I'm super excited. Like um, after this deal, now I'm like looking to me and my partner, Kyle, we're looking to do deals on our own. So we're really interested in like asset management and like being on site property, um, you know, operators. Um, nice. Because I think... You know, there's there's kind of two ways you can go. A lot of people are starting funds. Um, so you can essentially do what I did and you can have your own fund of funds and you can raise a bunch of money and invest that fund in other people's deals. Um, 
which is a great way if you want to do that. Or you can be an actual owner operator. So, you know, people might be investing in your deals. So you're going to be the person who's responsible for the actual management of the asset, who's running around, hiring the people, running the thing, doing the account, you know, everything that it takes to run an apartment. Um, so that's awesome. the direction I'm headed now. Awesome. So let's go back before we jump into into the uh, operation side, and, and that's basically what you're heading to. Uh, but you jump from being uh, participating in syndications to then becoming a general partner in the deals by raising capital. Uh, how did that happen? How did you learn the skill of raising capital? Um, and and then you, you mentioned, I mean, I, you said you had a, a, a fund that you opened up a fund for mm -hmm. for different. Okay. So can you, can we, can we touch on that? And then why are you, instead of doing capital raising, you want to move back to do the operation side of the business? Mm -hmm. So um, the first question, $50,000 checks from strangers, that's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of framework, um, but it is automated. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something that kind of runs while you're sleeping. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can easily find two very wealthy friends in your network to write you $500,000 checks or, you know, five people to write you $200,000 checks. Um, so I think that's the way I was able to do it. And that's the way I want to continue doing it because actually like wealthy people know more wealthy people. So mm -hmm. I think that's really kind of how to go forward. Because again, you're like, it's a lot less effort and it's a lot more intimate. Um, I, I actually, because you're really helping people. I've never been a salesman. I, you know, maybe a, I guess we're all salesmen to some degree, but like, um, really this investment sells itself. I mean, it's a super, super powerful investment vehicle. Like, especially like when people come to invest for the first time, the philosophy is not to like try to get as much money as you can for your own deal. It's, Hey, let me, you know, invest, get, write me a small check. Let me prove myself and then invest with me for the rest of your life. Like mm -hmm. that's how powerful an investment vehicle it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And then the second question was um, why I want to go into operational. Maybe. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So with being a capital raiser, um, it is fun. And some people really like it because your job is essentially to literally just educate people. Like I said, you're not selling anything. You're just showing them what this is. And then they respond with, that's too good to be true. And then you show them why it's not. So it, it really, you know, it might sound salesy, but it's really not. You're just educating people about investing. Um, but that's kind of what drives me away because I think I'm a very hands-on person um, and I really, you know, I like the control aspect of being like a real estate investor. And like what got me excited about this stuff in the first place, like I said, was, you know, the, the actual benefits. So like the principal pay down and appreciation, depreciation, cash flow. And I think you can really reap those benefits the most when you're actually the, the lead operator, the lead sponsor. Um, and every, you know, every part of the team is super responsible for a lot of things and they're all dependent on each other. I think that's just kind of the niche I want to fill as being like the lead sponsor and taking down deals and being the one running the show. Um, just because I think, I mean, there's the most money to be made there. There's the most stuff to be learned. And I think there's the most people to impact. Um, nice. And again, not, not to say that like being a capital raiser is bad or not good. It's just, I feel like if I were to do that for the next five, 10 years of my life, I just wouldn't be developing as many skills, you know, I'd just be having a lot of lunches and coffees and getting to meet a lot of people, which is awesome. But like I said, I just don't think that meshes exactly with my personality. Yeah, no, and that, that's, that's perfectly fine. I mean, some people are more of a uh, uh, social and like you said, you know, it's, it's just more of an educational uh, career. Uh, some people are just like you and it depends on their personality. I mean, there's so many ways, there's so many avenues on, on how to get into real estate investing and, and how to branch out. Uh, the fact that you had that experience at, at that young age and, and the network and people that are willing to show you the uh, the, the ways of doing it uh, and support you on it, uh, that's, that's fantastic, man. I, I love that story. So so you have your partners and now you're trying to look for, for deals. What is your, your criteria? Uh, what markets are you looking at? Um, yeah, tell us some about that. Yeah, so we're actually playing to our advantage. So like I said, my partner's also young. Um, we're also, you know, legally single at least. And, you know, <laughs> we're, we're young and we don't have kids. We don't have a lot of obligations that other people have. So the way we're able to 
kind of leverage that is we're going to actually go manage the property on site, potentially live in it. So yeah. we're looking at, in our backyard. We're in Austin, Texas. I was born and raised here. He was born and pretty much raised here. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking for like 70 to 150 unit multifamily, um, something that's big enough that we can get third party management in there, but not something too big. Um, and we're also looking for like 70s to 80s build stuff, um, typical like garden style value add, um, which believe it or not, is still there. If you look hard enough, um, if you talk to enough brokers, it's still out there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like I said, that's that's what we're looking for because essentially that's kind of like the, the upper limit too because you're not going to find any like 400 stuff that was built in the 70s or 80s or yeah or it, would, if, it would just be it class is, next class yeah right or if it is going to a firm <laughs> so yeah exactly we actually we actually just got beat on a deal um by people who were willing to go zero days due diligence and a hundred thousand dollars hard day one so essentially you know that's just not something we're going to match they're, yeah they, they're literally going window shopping for apartments so no, I mean that, that's kind of the struggle you face is like a small firm, but that's that's what we're doing. Yeah, no, and, and I mean you you gotta find a deal eventually. It's just a matter of keep looking. Uh, you have the experience, you have the the the, the team, the network, the mentors. Uh, that's pretty awesome, man. And, and the fact that you guys are determined and so young. Um, just to and, and this is not my show, man. This is your show, but I want to share something similar that I'm planning on doing. Uh, I, once I retire from the Marine Corps, I'm moving to Tampa. And, and I told my brother the same thing. Hey, if we find a deal in Tampa, um, I'm going to live in one of the units. I'm going to house hack this, this uh, apartment building. Um, so that's that's a pretty good idea, man. It's, 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 you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the experience and in, in, in the fact that, I mean, I, I love the fact that you're so young, bro. I mean, you have your head in the right place. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people that are going to be listening to this stuff is like, man, where was I when I was 21? I, I can't even remember. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Yeah, man. Uh, so mainly it's going to be Austin then, just because you guys are right there, boots on the ground. You guys are not looking anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's actually the cool thing. Like you said, um, everyone's situation is a little different. And like, obviously we're young and we're going to play that advantage. Um, but again, there's, there's a lot of ways to be creative because like by doing that, we could potentially get rid of the property management company or at least cut payroll a lot. Um, and when you do that, deals just go crazy. So, you know, something yeah. that might, might be a 12% IRR or, or, you know, certain, certain metrics that you're projecting, they just double <laughs> when yep. you get rid of the property management fee and the payroll. Um, so that gives us a lot of wiggle room uh, and uh, some room to learn. But at the same time, you know, for the investors, it actually gives them a sweet deal because it's like, hey, you know, you're not going to be getting these returns forever. <laughs> like the only reason yeah. you're getting these returns is because we're young and we have something to prove. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like a double sided coin because on one hand, like, you know, it's always a little frustrating to get into your first deal as a lead sponsor. Um, but also it's like, you know, it, it's easy to make deals work like that. And, you know, if you're a yeah. maintenance man, then fire the maintenance man. Go fix the toilets yourself. You know, go live in it. Um, th there's a lot of ways to be creative. And like you're, you're house hacking on steroids, man. That's, that's exactly. awesome. Just like yeah. the guy behind you. <laughs> no, yeah. man, that, that's amazing, bro. Let me let me let me ask you this, man. Um, in, in before we close. 21 years old, man. I, I, I know a lot of people, uh, young people, even me, you know, when I was young, thinking that, hey, they're not going to pay attention to me. They're not going to believe in me because I'm so young. How do you overcome that that um, uh, that limit of belief that, you know, you have to be older for people to trust you and believe in your, in your vision? Yeah, that's a funny question because I think definitely before I had done a deal, I had that like to the max and people would project that to me to the max. So it's like, you have no idea what you're doing. It's cute. Little real estate thing, whatever. And yeah. then once you close on a deal, people look at you like a phenom sometimes. I mean, not everyone, like yeah. some people definitely still think I'm full of, you know what, but like um, some people think it's the coolest thing in the world. Some people think I'm still just way over my head. Don't know what I'm doing. And I think the best thing honestly is to just ignore it. Like, I've kind of stopped trying to put my age in stuff. And like, I don't want that to really be a factor anymore. I just want to be, I want to compete with the big dogs. I mean, I, I want to be as good as people who've been doing this for 60 years. And I just want to be, um, I want to be a well-known operator. I want to be someone who, who is known to close, someone who's known to give investors great returns and someone who's known to like do good for the community. And like, I don't care if, you know, if I'm 21 or if I'm 60 or 80 or yeah. whatever. Um, I just want to be, respected and, you know someone I, I gotta shout out rob beardsley he actually kind of put that 
in my head because I mean the dude he's maybe 23 maybe I shouldn't be spilling his age but he's he's a very mm-hmm. young dude and uh, I remember asking him about that and I, I was like man how old are you like doing this stuff and he kind of told me the same thing he's like yeah I don't want people to know I, I don't want people to care mo- most of all like I just want to be good at what I do period and that's yeah. kind of like the mindset I try to have no that that's good man but also is it's a good factor that you shared your age because I mean to me it's I admire people like you guys, you know, it's so young and, 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 and so focused on what you want to do. The fact that you found your your mission in, in life and you probably, I mean, way ahead of, down the road, probably something big, find something bigger uh, than what you guys are currently doing. But you guys are doing, I mean, huge things compared to a lot of people, all older and younger. Uh, so that to me, I think, plays in your advantage and the fact that you, you already got the cre- uh, credibility, like you said. You close on, on several deals. Uh, you have the experience. You have the network, uh, and now you're building your own company, and, and you're doing it in the most humble way, which is living in the property. And you're gonna get your hands dirty. And you probably at this point you probably don't need it, um, but you're trying to make it. You're trying to make your deals sweeter for the investors, um, which build more credibility. And, and not only that, but tells a lot about you guys. Um, one is I admire you, man, a lot, and I admire your story. Uh, for our audience, where can they find more about you? Um, where can they contact you uh, and, and, and see about your, your future projects? Yeah, so you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, I should be the only Van Hagee, I think, in the world, so you should be able to find me. Um, and then you can also go to vanhagee.com, uh, V-A-N-H-A-G-Y-E.com. Uh, and then also I have Instagram, also Van Hagee. I have the luxury of having that username for pretty much anything I want. Um, and yeah, I, I try to, I'm trying to be better about responding to stuff uh, with like Instagram and social media because I try to stay off, but also like I see the value in it. Um, so yeah. Nice, man. Awesome. Hey, for our audience, uh, please hit him up, you know, uh, check him out on, on his uh, social media accounts. Uh, for those of you who are seeing the, uh, the YouTube uh, edition, please uh, leave us a review, five star review, leave us some comments, uh, leave, give us some love. Um, I appreciate it, Van, for, uh, for your, your story, your time, and uh, I'll see you soon, guys. Thanks so much, man. Let me start recording. Uh, thank you, brother. Appreciate it.